okay, uh, I just got back from seeing The Master, and, uh, oh, The Master is one of those movies that I've wanted to see for months, you know, I've been hearing all the buzz about it, hearing all the talks, read the reviews, seeing how good this movie is supposed to be, and, uh, the problem with seeing a movie like this is after hearing all that hype, you're, uh, immediately expected to be, you know, blown away by some, by a movie, and the thing about The Master is that, you know, despite the, you know, the big budget, the, the big actors, big performances, these grandiose things that the movie purports to be about, really at its, at its heart, it really is really kind of a, a, a small, personal movie about the, about the, the main character and his relationship to the people who he meets. Well, the movie was written and directed by Paul Thomas Anderson, he's made lots of movies that lots of people love, he's made movies like Magnolia, and There Will Be Blood and Punch Drunk Love. I've only seen a There Will Be Blood and Punch Drunk Love of his, his movies, and although I really admired both of them, neither of those movies I thought was really spectacular. No, neither of them was true, truly, truly great in my view. Like, There Will Be Blood had lots of great stuff going, had a tremendously ambitious story and a wonderful main performance, but really had kind of had a, a hollow emotional center. Well, on the other end of the spectrum, Punch Drunk Love, I thought, had a tremendous emotional connection, but had a story that really didn't go anywhere. So, I've been re really wanting to see a, a Paul Thomas Anderson movie that I could really uh, love all the way through, that I could really find a, a true connection with, uh, with the characters emotionally as well, well as the story. And The Master is pretty much a, as close as that as I've gotten in his library so far, because... The main character in this movie is named Freddie Quill. He's played by, by Joaquin Phoenix, and he's he's a uh, a Navy veteran uh, of World War II who has been really severely just damaged by the war. His performance reminds me a lot of uh, Robert Nero's performance as Travis Bickle in Taxi Driver. I mean, just like that one, we we know he's a former soldier. We know he, we know he's been damaged severely in the war, but we don't know exactly what caused him to be so damaged. We only know what the results are. And we kind of seen flashbacks that before he went to the war, he was a fairly normal, if maybe a, a bit awkward kind of guy. But but now, after the war, he just become just so com completely just w weird. So, he seems to be the, like, re reduced to the basic instincts of a human, like a human animal, almost. He, he lashes out in anger. He, he's violent at times. He he, see, he wants to have sex with every woman he sees. He just he, he seems to have all of the uh, resistance, all, all of the imp, impulse control just dra drain out of him. He in, in in the war, even just the way he talks just seems kind of just weird, weird as if he doesn't know how how to respond at times. As if he really just can't. As what he's saying, I really can't describe. I bet that well. But anyway, the uh, the movie begins with uh, with him after having been dismissed from the navy a few years before, somehow finding himself on a on the yacht of this mysterious organization, this mysterious uh, uh, religious type group led by Philip Seymour Hoffman. Now, much of the buzz before around this movie, even before it was made, was that the that was that this group that's called the Cause in the movie was supposed to be sort of an XP of Scientology. And yeah, if you know anything about Scientology, you'll definitely see parallels here, but really, the movie isn't really about that. So, this could be just about anything, but the Scientology thing makes it, makes the uh, connection, focuses the connection between uh, the Philip Seymour Hoffman character and the Joaquin Phoenix character. And the and even though Philip Seymour Hoffman is initially kind of, kind of upset with him for sneaking on his boat, they, he feels just a connection to him. And just, uh, initially because he, he likes the, he likes Phoenix's you know, homemade liquor that he carries around with him, but uh, after that they really do feel like they have a connection. And the, just the byplay between these characters really is fascinating. It's, it's the best part of the movie. No. There are some really fantastic scenes of the movie where they have to go through this processing. You know, this is another one of those yeah, Scientology-related things in the movie where, the, where they just, they just sit at a table and, and stare at each other while they, while Felix Seymour Hoffman just asks Joaquin Phoenix question after question, often the same question several times in a row. You can just see see him try answering the questions just completely on impulse because that's the way the Joaquin Phoenix character works. 
and just the way they just go back and forth really is intense. And there's and there's one scene that just that just grabbed me right away. There's like it's where he a Philip Seymour Hoffman asks Joaquin Phoenix to try to answer the questions that he's about to ask completely without blinking. And I swear I probably wasn't blinking at all as I was watching him asking just because I was just so so in, enraptured in the in the questions and as the, he just keeps answering the questions as he just gets quicker and quicker as, as he's concentrated more and all of a sudden the movie just cuts into a flashback. It really is just a, a wonderful piece of film filmmaking there. And yeah, the those parts of the movie, the movie where the Joaquin Phoenix character is put to the test by Philip Seymour Hoffman, I think are are the best parts of the movie when he's going through these weird exercises. You know, some the, at one point he they actually intercut between three different exercises. One where he has to walk back and forth between a wall and a window, trying to describe something about the wall or the window each time he goes there with his eyes closed. But at the same time, he's talking to Philip Seymour Hoffman's wife, played by Amy Adams, where she just where she's asking him to like say imagine her eyes changing color or she's reading something to him and he has to try to just listen to her as she reads it. And then another one where he where he's sitting there next to Philip Zimmer Hoffman's son in law and they're taking turns just talking to each other for, for like a minute at a time and the other person is trying to not respond at all. And just seeing the way the character responds to these exercises and seeing the way other people respond to him uh, really just just digs deep into this character. And it allows Phoenix to really give a tremendous performance, and really is is a great performance. Just kind of, while sometimes you know, play, playing in insane or playing something like this could could be come over the top and unreal, unrealistic. And there are some really just big, big shouty moments in this performance, but really it feels exactly like what the character would do. This is probably the sort of performance that James Dean would have would end up giving if he hadn't died so early. It really is a tribute to to Joaquin Phoenix and he's able to make this character so good and all the performances this year are great. I mean Philip Zimmer Hoffman, he's he's great, of course he's always great. I haven't seen him give a bad performance yet. And he just kind of is a kind of way to capture and portray just the charisma it would take for a guy to create this sort of re religious organization that really is poppycock and and although he has this kind of this endless charm and endless charisma, this smile on, on all the time, he really this really does create is really more of like a facade that covers a sort of a real very curled up anger that we sense that's within him that sometimes leaks out but most of the time it's just like just they're just barely beneath the surface and even if he's like smiling and looking at you you can tell that he, there's something really dangerous bubbling underneath there that's really I think where the connection that he sees between himself and, and Phoenix because while he's really oh while he He's really sophisticated, really suave and, and charming all the time, but it still has that level of, of anger and violence within him that he just keeps just barely repressed. Phoenix's character is totally at the mercy of his emotions and totally at the mercy of his impulses and just lashes out like I mentioned before. And that's just sort of jarring contrast is really at, at the heart of the movie. There's one point near the end of the, end of the movie where the camera cuts between Joaquin Phoenix looking this way and Phoenix Hoffman looking at him this way. We never see the two of them in the same shot after they begin their conversation. And just the way the shot is lit and directed, you it just shows just how much of a contrast they are, even with their faces. I mean, with Phoenix Hoffman's face all, all, all big and well, well groomed, uh, kind, of, kind of puffy with every everything perfectly in place, while Joaquin Phoenix is all, is all like lined and, and hollow and and just. Com just so completely different in every way, and it really just underlines the, the contrast between those characters. And yet they're still trying to be able to fi find this connection with each other, and that's really what I think the movie is about. Really, how I see what the movie is about, about the the need for people to create connections with each other. One of the running undercurrents of this movie is the fact that the Joaquin Phoenix character was in love with a girl from his hometown before he had to leave for the to go into the war. And he he can't stop thinking about her, even if he even when he tries to have sex with just like every other woman he meets, he still thinks about this girl back home and he's still in love with her. And that that need for protection really leaves some sort of a hollowness inside and he tries to create to join with the Hoffman character. And the Hoff 
independent character who does seem to fill it that void for a while, and he does seem into almost at times stop the Phoenix character who's you know almost psychotic tendencies, but he still isn't able to do it because the teachings of the Hoffman character are all about re repressing your emotions, all about like, leaving behind the thing, things that drive you forward. He even he says at one time that, that laughter is the is the response of an animal, and humans aren't animals. That sort of of emotional denial is not the sort of thing that will that allows him to create a truly good connection with anybody. It's, and he has all these people around him who are uh, who will listen to every word he says and everything he does as if it's well, his gospel, so to speak. But the fact that they they don't that all they're talking about is like past li lives and and stuff like that really means that nothing they're talking about really creates a connection to each other. It's all it's all about believing these things about inside themselves, or sometimes which, which gives you an idea of how these people think that this will help them because it allows them to maybe think of themselves a little bit more, but doesn't help them to really connect with others. And, then, and yeah, those sort of things are really the things that you're just thinking about these things all the way through the movie, and that's really what makes this movie so good. It really a, is a thought-provoking sort of movie. You think it, it engages your mind as well as it engages your emotions, and really everything about this movie is good all the way through. I haven't mentioned the performances by Amy Adams yet, and she she is so good here. I mean, she doesn't have a whole lot of scenes, but this is so completely different than anything I've seen her in before, and she play as I mentioned before, she does play Flip Smirhoffman's wife, and in many ways she's even more devoted and more uh yeah, and has more of a sincere and powerful belief in what in the in the cause than Hoffman himself. I mean you and you see here at times just talk just talking about what the what what's been happening to the group and you just see this like see seething anger in her and this frustration and really is just a very good performance by Amy Adams and the the direction here is very good. Paul Thompson, of course, has a, has a great visual eye. He shot this movie in 70, mil, in 70 millimeters, where we get some really great, great panoramic shots, and also makes the, some of the close-ups look just really, really deep and really detailed. And the, the, the score by Johnny Greenwood is also very good. I found he's the same guy who composed the music for There Will Be Blood, and I found that one to be kind of distracting at times, kind of like almost layered over the screen at times, but it, it works really well. Though here, it just integrates within the action. I mean, this is just an excellent movie all, all, all the way through. I wasn't bored for a second, and and just, I can't wait to be able to see it again, because I'm sure I, when I see it again, I'll find, I'll be able to look at even more things, like more of the connections between the characters, more of the, more of the little, little ticks in the performances by Walking Phoenix and Philip Seymour Hoffman. This the, this one of those movies that you just know there's so much more there beneath the surface that you just, you just want to see it again as soon as it's over. That's pretty much I think one of the best things you can say about a movie like this. So yeah, I say, see the master. You won't see another another movie like it this year. Great performances, uh, uh and a kind of really cool fireplay play between actors, a great movie about what really what it means to have to find a connection with somebody else. Uh, go and see it. You'll be glad you did.